All right, so who's heard a talk about large language models yet in one of these theaters? Pretty much everybody. All right, what about one on retrieval augmented generation? Oh, uh, like half. OK. All right, so we're going to talk about some basics, but we're also going to talk about some interesting things. Here, take a look. So first, I'm going to start with some of the challenges. This year, I've built probably 100 plus different RAG systems for customers. Uh, whether that's a vector database plus a knowledge graph plus uh, large language models in multiple settings, fine tune models, et cetera. And I've run into a number of different things. We're going to talk about those to kind of ground the talk and tell you why I've run into them. And that just gives you a basis for what I'm going to talk about. We're going to talk about data strategy. We're going to talk about how I'm using these LLMs. We're going to talk a little bit about Redis because obviously I have to, right? Come on, you know, it's one of these talks. And then we're going to get into RAG, and then something called semantic caching, which is actually going to be really useful to you to both increase QPS and also reduce your cost of using any large language model, any one. And then we're going to talk about bedrock and how you can do this really easily. So it's going to be kind of jam-packed. They gave me 20 minutes, so if I go too fast, you can come see me at the Redis booth. I'll stick around for like an hour and you ask questions, all right? All right, so I talked about challenges. What are some of the challenges I've faced this year building these systems? Well, the first is cost, where the customer hosts the model. Okay, do you put it on your own hardware? When's the last time you were able to get an H100 GPU? Seriously. It takes a while. And then, okay, you're going to host it on a cloud? Even if you're doing it yourself, those costs rack up. Even Lambda with a really good pricing, right? AWS has great pricing for GDN4, but maybe you need higher throughput. Those kind of considerations are really hard, and it takes a really long time to figure out the cost optimization profile. Okay, quality. A lot of people are scared about hallucinations. You know the number one thing I hear of? Ah, we're going to do it internal because we're scared that a customer is going to hear the wrong thing. And so, oh, everything, every single one of these is an internal use case. But we can get better than that. Performance. You know what the QPS of a large language model, on average, one of these ones that's 70 billion parameters or more? It's like two. Like two queries per second. That is something that has not really existed in a lot of these high transaction, high speed ecosystems before. You don't usually have something that has two queries per second. I mean, that is a, a sizable shift from where we've been from the databases that support a lot of transactions per second. Security, imagine if you need a model, and this is a setup that's coming to play many a time, that needs both externally facing assets and internally facing assets to be consumed. Do you fine tune that model? You can't do that because then that model could possibly expose that internal information to the public. And so there's all these challenges, all these things that have come up. And one thing I like to do is try to say rethink data strategy. It sounds kind of buzzwordy, but everybody and their mother wants a private chat GPT at very base level, those internal use cases I was telling you about. Everybody wants something that says, here are a bunch of my PDFs and PowerPoints. Now answer all of my questions and all of the things that my users are going to ask. Whether it is internal or external, it is essentially a private chat GPT. And so we're going to start there as a base use case. And so what do you do for that? Do you fine tune? Well, again, aforementioned problems of internal, external. And then again, infra costs. So how often are you going to do that? How long does that take? That knowledge can't be updated rapidly. What, what happens if that PDF gets updated one time a day? Are you going to retrain that LLM one time a day? Again, back to cost. Are you going to feed everything into the prompt? I'm sure everybody's read the loss in the middle paper, right? If you haven't, you should absolutely go read the loss in the middle paper. Um, you know, I think Claude is up to, what, 200K now? Well, you can't find uh, a lot of that information in the generated output if it's in the middle of that prompt. Go look at it. You fill it with 200K tokens, which will be expensive, by the way, back to cost again, and everything in the middle, it's going to forget. It's called loss in the middle. Great paper. You should go check it out. So this has got to be a middle ground. And this is how I explain it to people. What is it? What's the middle ground? I'm sure you've heard of talk about it today. It's vector databases, right? And so what is a vector database? Really quickly, because I'm sure everybody's heard something on this. Very, from very basics, you take unstructured data, audio, images, text, anything that's unstructured data. I say it's kind of wrong, but anything but an Excel spreadsheet, basically. That's why it's a Swiss Army knife and machine learning toolkit. You take any of those types of unstructured data, you create embeddings from them using something like Ada from OpenAI or one of those hugging face models off the shelf, 
And then you create your embeddings and you create a search space, usually with an algorithm like K, and N, uh, K nearest neighbors, approximate nearest neighbors, in the form of one of the more popular ones like hierarchical navigatable small worlds, Facebook AI similarity search, FICE, et cetera. Now, what changed with vector databases from the previous generation of FICE and a lot of the other vector search algorithms to vector databases is you got full CRUD support. You got high-speed transactions. You got redundancy. You got persistence. You got all these other things that databases like Redis have had for years. And so I will take a quick detour to talk about Redis, because I told you I would. Everybody here is familiar with Redis. Raise your hand if you've used Redis at least once. Yeah, come on. It's everybody. Um, everybody's familiar with open source core. You've used Redis for caching. You've used Redis for messaging, message store, et cetera. And you've used these data structures, bitmaps, hashes, et cetera. You might not know that you can also store JSON and probabilistic models. And then, see, this is where I'm starting to lose people. I can see it. You might not know that. You can also have it as a document database. OK. And then you might not know that we also brought a lot of those clients in-house so that we maintain them now so that we can make sure that that code is of high quality. And we also released a new version of Redis Insights so that you can check it out. Honestly, it's, that one's free. You should just go check that out if you're using Redis, even if it's any variation of Redis. It's very good. Then we added more. And so recently we added event streaming, data integration, RDI. Very cool, but I don't have time to talk about it. Query and search is the one I'm talking about today. Essentially, this is a plug-in to Redis. And this allows you to then create a secondary index structure on top of all of your JSON or hash data inside of Redis that you can then query at the speed of Redis. Those same single millisecond transactions that you're used to, you can now perform a vector search in those same single millisecond times. And then lastly, you've got all of the enterprise goodies. And so a lot of people think of Redis, right? Oh, it's a cache. It's not persistent. It's not a database. It's not. It's even better than that when you get to an enterprise database. And that's the difference. If you're using open source, you're right. If you're using enterprise, you're not. Because there's a huge separation between those two things. And that's why I usually like to explain this, because people are like, they go download the open source Docker container, like, hey, the search command's not working. This guy's bogus. What is he talking about? Well. It's because it's in Redis Stack and Redis Enterprise. And so I want to be very explicit that the vector search capabilities that I'm going to talk about today are in the Enterprise version that is also not a last cache. We love you, AWS, but it's not a last cache, which is also a very common misconception. OK. All of that is Redis Enterprise, as I mentioned. Now back to vector database for LLMs. <laughs> OK. Three different topics that I'll talk about today. One interesting thing is that Redis can be used for all of these, and you'll see at the end why it's actually really good for it. Retrieval augmented generation, which you've heard about, or at least most of you heard about, I will explain in detail. Conversational memory is turning out to be a really big one because chat interfaces are actually one of the most popular ways right now to expose this kind of asset. And so if chat interfaces are the dominant medium, you need it to remember the last 10 messages the user said. You also need to remember the last 10 relevant messages the user said. And that's a lot different type of search. Semantic caching, which I'll talk about, very cool as well. OK, so what is retrieval augmented generation? I don't like a lot of people's graphs with this. They have a graph that's like this to this over here and this arrow here. And I'll show you one that looks kind of like that later. But uh, since it's mine, I can diss it. Retrieval augmented generation is very simple. It is exactly as it sounds. You have a query. You take that query, or some variation of that query if you're doing something like hypothetical document embeddings. And you're going to take that and then create an embedding with that and use it to look up relevant information using vector search. So vector search is essentially a process by saying how similar, it's technically how far away, but using you know, the opposite of the distance you find the similarity, right? So how close is one vector to another, hence you find out how similar things are. And so with that user query, you can then say, oh, I know these three pieces of information are very relevant. And so when that large language model then goes to get your prompt that you've written and instructed it, these are instruction-based models, in the middle of that instruction is three relevant pieces of information. In this case, it's documentation on Redis. But you can imagine it's your PDFs. It's your FAQ at your company. It's your documentation. It's 
anything that's unstructured data. And again, this is why it's the Swiss Army knife of the machine learning toolkit. Because embeddings are incredibly versatile, and as we become more multimodal, this is only going to become more of a dominant paradigm. Because embeddings can handle any type of unstructured data. And as soon as we also do some other things that are going to come out soon, retrieval augmented generations can become even more powerful. All right, so I'll dive in here. Why retrieval augmented generation? We talked about some of those costs and those challenges, right, that we were talking about earlier. How does retrieval augmented generation actually alleviate that? Well, one, it's faster. How long does it take to fine tune a model? Even if it's one epic, it could take hours. How long does it take for you to insert a hash into Redis? About two milliseconds or less. Even if it's a JSON document, which you can also use with vector search, four milliseconds. And so if you need something that is a retrieval augmented generation paradigm, and you need that knowledge base to be updated rapidly, say, oh, what's the rate of this mutual bond? Done that one this year. Can that information be stale? No. That needs to be updated in real time. Say you're a factory, and you have sensors all around your factory. Hey, what's the status of my system? Can that be stale? No. Fresh, fast, has to be. And so there are retrieval augmented generation paradigms that rely on an external knowledge base that is updatable in real time. And so that is one major benefit of this paradigm. Again, also, it's cheaper. Fine tuning is very expensive. If you look at the ROI justification over time, and you're doing fine tuning, fine tuning, fine tuning, fine tuning, hosting a, a dedicated knowledge base, even if it grows over time, is going to be cheaper. Trust me, I've done a lot of fine tuning. It gets super expensive over time if you try to maintain it that way. Also, sensitive data. We talked about this earlier. What if you want a segment? You need ACLs. Hey, these users can see this. Hey, these users can see this. Hey, these are external users. What do you do? You can't fine tune it. Usually, fine tuning is even better for behavioral changes anyway. I want my model to talk like this. It's not better for contextual information. And so all of these things together make RAG, retrieval augmented generation, a really powerful paradigm. And it's used a lot and obviously talked a lot about here. Um, and I won't continue to hammer every point of it home. But if you have more questions on RAG, you can come find me uh, at the, the booth later. I want to get to semantic caching, though, because it's something that a lot of people don't know about. OK, so what is semantic caching in broad strokes? Every, who, uh, who basically knows how caching works, right? You know, one to one, you take one thing, put it in the database. Oh, is it the same thing? You get the same thing back, right? Well, that speeds up websites, right? Because Redis is faster than Postgres or MySQL or what have you. OK, same paradigm, except for what if it's a semantically similar question and not the exact same question? What if the question is, what is the capital of France? And the next user said, what really is the capital of France? They deserve the same answer. Should you pay for that LLM invocation twice? No. You don't want to do that. I don't want you to do that. Why don't we save you some money? That's the same paradigm that caching has been in all of computer science for years, right? Except for now, you can give it a threshold. You can say, all right, 98% similar. Say you have an FAQ, right? You know most of the answers you want it to give. Ask them. Pre-populate it. You pay for that LLM one time through all your FAQ. Why would you keep paying for it randomly? Reduce the hallucinations. Stop paying for that. And then again, if you have something that updates in real time, you can use the eviction strategies, the same things that you've been using Redis for caching for years, and all of those different aspects, like time to live. Oh, say, I don't want these user responses to be older than an hour, right? Then you can use the same paradigms with now vector search and the ability to say a semantic threshold or even better visual threshold as I mentioned this is any type of unstructured data doesn't just have to be text how similar is this image say you're mid journey and you're trying to do images oh has a user put in a prompt like this before why am I generating that image again send it back or image similarity they're doing some kind of upscaling thing what if a user sent one like that send them back the same image if it's within the threshold Everything within a 98% or more similarity should just be sent back to the user. And that, we've already seen, justifies its own cost multiple times over. I've set up, as I said, a ton of these systems this year, justifies its own cost. 
even if you're paying us hundreds of thousands of dollars, if you have a system that is expensive in terms of LLMification, it's going to justify its own cost. And so I'll give you an example. Wow, that got loud. We have a library called Redis VL. Uh, my team builds it. It is a purpose-built client library for using Redis as a vector database. There's a thing right here. We rehosted our doc links, so if it doesn't automatically redirect you, let me know. But basic premise is right here, okay, that I was just talking about. And we call this LLM cache, but really it's a semantic cache. You can do both types of caching. You can do your traditional hash caching, same question, same answer, or you can give this a semantic threshold. This interface could not be simpler. You can put this in a decorator, you can put this on any function, you can put it on fast API routes, you can put it on a flask, et cetera, and every single time that you have a user that asks the same thing within that certain threshold, you're gonna save yourself some money and make your API faster. That's kind of the bottom line. And so it's really like a no-brainer. Even if you have something where you're like, all right, I'm only gonna use 200 megabytes of space, you're still gonna end up in your thresholds at, say, 98.9% .9 similarity. I promise you, you're still saving on LLM costs. You know how many times a user hits the same question twice? A lot. We did one for financial analysts. You know how many they ask the same thing? A lot. <laughs> and how similar their questions are. So help yourself, check it out. All right. This is a fun one. Who here is familiar with archive.com? Reads a lot of papers, I do, yeah. So it's, it's a place for scientific papers. I spend a lot of my days there checking out new stuff. It's almost impossible to keep up with a fire hydrant of things that come from archive.com. But uh, this is one that I created with Harrison Chase at Langchain, if you're familiar with Langchain. Uh, it's a framework for helping you build up these types of RAG applications. Um, and Harrison and I put this one together because we were curious could I create like a research assistant where if I put in a topic and it just searched that, you know, BM25 regular text search on archive and got me the top 10 papers, could I automatically chunk those up, index those, put them into a Redis database and then be able to say questions and talk to like a guru of that topic? And so we spent a while on this, but it's really interesting. It does better with some topics versus others, but this is all of archive. So obviously, if you're a company, you should optimize in a certain area on a certain topic. But this is just an overall test of how can it do in a super broad setting. And it has settings to show you, I want this context window length. I want this amount of documents. I want this amount of chunks per document. And it will allow you to change those controls to help you learn how better to do this. And I use it as a learning tool. So if you go and check this out here, I'll put that up there so you can check out the link, but that it, it, like actual platform, the GUI, it's a Streamlit app, will help you actually learn how a lot of this works, and yes, this does use semantic caching. You'll see how much faster it is when you ask a similar question, and you can also change that distance threshold as well. So, last thing I'm gonna talk about, because I got a minute 30 left, is Amazon Bedrock. Obviously, we're here at reInvent, right? We gotta talk a little bit about AWS. Well, Bedrock's really cool. It allows you to just click through and make it so that you can deploy Redis into the marketplace and Amazon. You say you have a big commit, right, to Amazon like most people here or something like that. Well, you can just go in and click, click. We help, we worked with the Bedrock team to make this as easy as possible. And you can use your Redis Enterprise database with Bedrock, which is gonna handle a lot of that stuff that I've talked about today for you. And obviously I couldn't go too technically into RAG and some of the other things like chunking and whatnot, but if you have more questions about that kind of more technical depth, please feel free to come talk to me. Um, Bedrock is really interesting and I highly recommend you check it out. I wish I actually had a little bit more time to talk about it, but you can see a general representation of what I was talking about today and how you would do that with Bedrock right here. All right, so lastly, I will show you uh, Redis VL, that's that client library I was talking about with the semantic caching and what have you. And then also, this is my team's re uh, or GitHub organization with all of our examples. We just do a bunch of them for people just to, you know, not all of them are, you know, great, right? But they're easy. They're meant to be like kind of walkthroughs. So check them out. If you have questions, hit us up on GitHub, file issues. We love that stuff. Um, and thank you so much. That's my Twitter if you want to see me talk about RAG more often. <laughs> yeah, thanks.